It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. How to introduce our final speaker of the day. Uh, I bow to no one in my admiration of John Bourne. Uh, not only did his length of career at the uh, University of Birmingham almost rival mine at the IWM, which roughly parallel, I think, they were on to 30 odd years, and uh, I think no, no one has done more than John to establish. University of Birmingham was Centre of Excellence in First World War Studies and uh, the MA programme there which Gary Sheffield's now inherited is I think uh, living proof of that. Not only that, uh, when I retired in 1999 but it was John who offered me a lifeline in getting me involved in the University of Birmingham and the future MA programme so I own a great personal debt for that but keeping me off the streets, as it were, and <laughs> well beside that. Um, and of course, he's got some wonderful publications to his name, uh, including a very valuable book, uh, which you don't see as often as we should, written in the Great War in 1989, and with Gary, uh, the edition of Douglas Haig's War Diaries and Letters, which appeared, I think, in 2005. He's still currently working, I don't know when it's going to be finished, on the multi-biography of British generals in the First World War, but if you want to know anything about British generals in the First World War, there is no other real source than John. And uh, he's also uh, working, I understand, with Gary Sheffield on an edition of Rawlinson's papers. Mm. And I did say that John is the only other fellow masochist among our football supporters. <laughs> Rob is a Man U supporter, which I mean, anybody can be a Man U supporter. But Rob at least was born in Salford, which gives him some proprietary right, I think. But uh, with my club, bottom of the league, Ipswich Town, I don't know there's a Norwich supporter in here today. <laughs> um, and John, who supports the team below my other team, which is Cheltenham Town now, Fort Vale, just minutely below. So uh, anyway, I, as I say, a man I greatly admire. The other thing is never follow John as a speaker, because the bugger speaks usually without notes and finishes precisely on the hour. And I hope he's going to do both today. John Ball, ladies and gentlemen. These lectures are supposed to uh, fit together seamlessly, so I should begin with the car that Rob Thompson was driving at the famous conference Peter referred to in Salford. It was an exceptionally hot day. It was actually cup final day, I think. And um, was it a Cadillac? Uh, Buick. A Buick. Oh, um, so Robert had an open top, and he kindly gave me a lift back from Salford University to Piccadilly Station. So he was driving open top, uh, wearing a pair of sunglasses and as we were driving through the Manchester traffic I said Rob why are all these cars getting out of our way he said they think I'm a drugs baron <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he looked like <laughs> that's the nearest I've ever come to being Tony Soprano and the nearest I ever want to be to Tony Soprano now, as I look around this room, I can see that there are some people in it, indeed possibly many people in it, who may remember the famous BBC fly-on-the-wall documentary about the parachute regiment, the Paras, which I seem to remember was broadcast the same year as the Falklands War, 1982. And there was a scene, I think, in episode one, 
where the recruits, potential recruits of the Parachute Regiment were gathered in a room and a series of people from the training uh, cadre came in to uh, uh, give them a pep talk. So the corporal came in and he said, apart from your mother, I am now the most important person in your life. And the sergeant came in and he said, apart from your mothers, I am now the most important person in your life. And the regimental sergeant major came in and he said, apart from your mothers, I'm now the most important person in your life. And the company commander came in and he said, apart from your mothers, I'm now the most important man in your life. Well, we've had a touch of that today, I think, because you can make an argument, as it were, for the corporal, the sergeant, the regimental sergeant major and the captain by saying, 1914 is the most important year of the war. 1915 is the most important year of the war. 1916 is the most important year of the war. 1917 is the most important year of the war. And there is truth in this. To me, the great unanswered question, the one I've never been able to answer myself satisfactorily, anyone here who's ever had a career in teaching will know, there's two levels of knowing and understanding. One is being able to tell young people enough to get through an exam. It doesn't mean that you actually have to know why there was an Italian Renaissance. As long as you give them 15 reasons that they can put down in an exam why there was an Italian Renaissance. But the other level is where you actually internalise it. You know, you believe it. Uh, I believe the technical expression is you've got your head round it. I have never got my head round why the Germans went to war in 1914. I know Sir Michael Howard always used to say that the test for the historian is to put himself in the position of not knowing what eventually happened. And we know what eventually happened. The German declaration of war in 1914 was a disaster for Germany and it was a disaster for Europe. And it's, it's difficult to see exactly what they were trying to achieve. It's also obvious that many of the key people who made the decision for war in Germany in 1914 were deeply pessimistic about the eventual outcome. It wasn't that they were so imbued with an air of you know, Teutonic superiority and efficiency and that they were uh, bound upon world domination, because I don't think that is the reason they went to war, even if I don't know what the reason was. I think that was the reason it wasn't. They were imbued with uh, an appalling degree of, of, of pessimism. And in some respects, Germany lost the war on the Marne in 1914. So you can argue that 1914 is the most important year of the war. And it took the rest of the First World War to convince the Germans that they lost the war on the Marne in 1914. You can argue that 1915 is the most important year of the war. As Bob Bushaway said this morning, it was the year in which the war became global. It was the year in which, at the operational level, on more than one front, the First World War uh, took on the, um, the texture, as John Terrain called it, of, of trench warfare, of trench stalemate, which is still most people's image of the First World War. It was also, uh, as Bob Bushaway said, quoting uh, Lance Corporal Jeffrey Husbands, uh, there was no going back. And this is obvious in Britain uh, when it sees the de demise of Britain's last ever Liberal government, the, not, the current one notwithstanding, and uh, the formation of the Asquith Coalition and the, uh, the appointment of David Lloyd George as Minister of Munitions. And there's a deep irony here because Lloyd George becomes, comes to embody uh, the political will to victory in Britain when he becomes Prime Minister in December 1916. And part of that political will to win is the willingness to sacrifice any number of pre-war political shibboleths in order to do it, some of which had already been sacrificed by the time Lloyd George became Prime Minister, notably the introduction of conscription. But at the same time, as Bill pointed out earlier, Lloyd George recoiled from the strategic and operational consequences of the political beliefs that he had. But there were others, notably uh, Reginald McKenna, who succeeded Lloyd George as um, Chancellor of the Exchequer in May 1915, who believed a satisfactory outcome to the war from a British perspective meant that Britain had to retain its economic and financial strength. And as Bill also pointed out, uh, by the end of 1916, that was no longer the case. I was deeply sympathetic uh, 
uh, to what Bill said earlier about the, the significance of 1916, not least because when we were planning this series of lectures, I was actually going to do 1916, and um, David Stevenson was invited to do 1918 because he's recently written a splendid book on, on 1918, um, which I think is called, I never remember the titles of books, not e with our backs to the wall. And um, David wasn't available so I said to Colin, well, we'll get Bill Philpot to do 1916 because he's written a splendid book on 1916 and I'll fill in for Stevenson on 1918, which just goes to show what a good old pro and trooper I am. <laughs> but if I'd, if I'd been giving the lecture myself, I think the, the general thrust of what I had to say would be very similar to what uh, Bill said on 1916. 1916 uh, exposed or torpedoed what Holger Herwig called the short war illusion. Now, the idea that the war would be over by Christmas, I, I think, is a bankrupt myth. Many people in the German high command did not believe that Germany could win a long war, but their de definition of a short war wasn't, it's going to be over by Christmas. But by the time you got to the end of 1916, you were taking them to a place they didn't want to go and a place that when they got there, they felt would be bad news, which undoubtedly it was. One of the most telling things for me in the whole history of 1916, uh, bearing in mind the view that we have of 1916, which is so encapsulated on the 1st of July, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, is that there, is no, there was no celebrations in Germany on the 1st of July, 1916. They didn't say, Ah, oh, the Tommies have attacked and we've given them a good kicking. Let's have a day of national celebration. They were far more concerned about the, the, the French penetration of their second line to the south. But above all, it was news the Germans didn't want to hear. Because the heart of the pessimism of 1914 is that Germany cannot win a long war, a material schlacht, fighting two major military powers on two fronts. And from the 1st of July 1916, it became apparent that the German army was going to have to fight three major military powers on at least two fronts, because the British, amazingly to the Germans, and even more amazingly to themselves, had turned themselves into a great military power, which on the 1st of July 1916 might have had a giant size, but it had not yet acquired a giant strength or a giant's guile. But as John Terrain always said, the, ins the most significant thing about the 1st of July is actually the 2nd of July. And the British didn't say, oh my God, look what's happened, let's give up. It was apparent to everyone, and not least the Germans, that the British were not going to go away. And there's this deep pessimism uh, within Germany that they can actually match allied material growing allied material superiority, particularly in, in the matter of uh, guns and, and ammunition. The German response to this, as Bill said, was to appoint uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, two men with the political sensibilities of a drill sergeant, in order to organise and galvanise German uh, economic <coughs> mobilisation. As a former colleague of mine, uh, Leonard Schwartz, used to say, Leonard descended from German Jews, had no great love of uh, Wilhelmine Germany, uh, and said that it, what broke Wilhelmine Germany was the attempts of Hindenburg and Ludendorff to make their ramshackle system work. And what forced them to do that was the fighting on the Somme and at Verdun in 1916. So I'm deeply sympathetic to the view that 1916 was the tipping point. But to be fair to young Thompson, 1917 is also important. If you look at it at the geopolitical level, it, is the, uh, it sees the overthrow of Tsarist autocracy, and it's significant that the United States enters the war after the fall of the Tsar. It made it much easier. There are a lot of citizens of the United States in April 1917 who had no love of the Tsar and Tsarist autocracy. So the fact that the Americans entered the war after the overthrow of Tsarist autocracy and the apparent establishment of a liberal regime in Russia made it much easier for Woodrow Wilson to declare, to declare war. It's also, that is the second significant thing about 1917, is the entry of the United States onto the war. 
Now, um, I would say um, that I have a deep loathing and disgust about Woodrow Wilson. All I can say is this is sheer prejudice, ladies and gentlemen. But when I wrote my who's who in the First World War with a thousand entries, Woodrow Wilson was the last entry I wrote because I dislike him so much. Um, nevertheless, when American scholars um, do from time to time, usually encouraged by Time magazine, um, to draw up the list of the 10 greatest presidents of the United States, Woodrow Wilson usually figures. And Woodrow Wilson usually figures because he is the first American president to grasp what a later American called the American century. That the 20th century was going to be the American century. And America, if America was to uh, achieve its manifest destiny in the modern context, it had to engage with the, with the real world. And Woodrow Wilson increasingly realised if the United States was going to play a role in the peace settlement, it had to take a part in the fighting. So the entry of the United States into the war is a significant moment uh, in, in the history of the 20th century and indeed in the history of the United States. At the operational level, uh, you also have the first really significant appearance of tanks uh, in the Battle of Cambrai. And although, I, again, I agreed with what Bob, both Bob and Rob said about uh, an operational method had effectively been established in 1916. The thing that most prefigures modern war, I think, is, is, is Cambrai rather than the Somme and Third Ypres, when you have a return of uh, surprise uh, to the operational battlefield where you have predicted artillery fire and where you have an effective, um, if limited in the sense that you can't carry it forward, use of tanks, but it's Cambrai that really shows the way ahead in 1918, perhaps more than any of the other battles which have been talked about. And of course, by the end of 1917, you have the other fundamental uh, change in the context of the history of the 20th century, and that is the overthrow of a liberal government in Russia by a Bolshevik coup d'etat. And so one of the things which haunts uh, the spectre at the feast uh, at the end of 1918 and through the peace settlement in 1919 uh, is that the genie is out of the bottle and maybe that something that many leaders, not least in Germany, feared that a great war of the kind that was fought would so destroy and distort the world that they'd grown up in that who knew what the future would hold? And we, kn we know, of course... Uh, what the future held, and it was not an appealing future. However, 1918 can offer something that 1914, 1915, 1916, and 1917 cannot offer. It was the year of victory. Indeed, it was the year of victories, because it was the year of victory on the Western Front between the Franco-British American alliance, if you want to call it that. It's a victory for an Anglo-Italian army on the Italian front. It's a victory for a Franco-British army on the Salonica front. And it's a victory for two British imperial armies, uh, one of them consisting of quite large numbers of Australians and the other consisting of a very large number of Indians uh, in Palestine and in uh, Mesopotamia. So it's a year of victories. It's also, and this in some ways, I've never quite understood why this has not made more impact upon consciousness. Because the truth is that 1918, despite being the year of victories, despite seeing the confirmation of the fall of Tsardom, the fall of the Hohenzollerns, the fall of the Habsburgs and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it does not resonate particularly in British national memory. As Bob Bushaway was telling me yesterday morning, as far as he could communicate anything yesterday morning when he was even in worse shape than he was this morning, um, that during his visit to Les Invalides in Paris, um, the, the French account of 1917 uh, was, uh, was all about, the, uh, sorry, 1918 was all about the Americans. You know, the Yanks are coming. Well, the Yanks had come. By 1918, uh, Petain famously said, we wait for the tanks and the Americans. Uh, and they are seen as central to the uh, Allied victory. 
uh, even at the operational level in 1918, which I uh, certainly do not. So it is perhaps surprising that 1918, uh, which is the year of victories, but can also fit into a, a traditional British interpretation of the war, which concentrates on the human costs of the war, which were severe in 1918. Absolutely severe. Uh, one thing I found teaching undergraduates, with the notable exception of our Norwich fan over there, Mr Ian Houghton, of course he was above this, was teaching undergraduates, even the dullest ones, knew one fact about the First World War, and that was it ended on the 11th hour, the 11th day, of the 11th month of 1918. But the presumption was, because it ended then, somehow in the weeks preceding, the months preceding, it somehow must be winding down and tailing off, which it most uh, assuredly was not. Some of the heaviest fighting of the war and some of the largest battles the British Army has ever taken part in, and certainly the greatest victories on land in the history of the British Army, took place between the 8th of August 1918 and the 11th of November 1918. It was significant when I was watching Mr Cameron's speech at the Imperial War Museum that when we're going to get the remembrance of the war, we're going to get a very traditional narrative of remembrance. Uh, we will commemorate the outbreak of the war. We will commemorate the 1st of July, 1916, naturally. And the date which we will commemorate in 1918 is the 11th of November. Now, the 11th of November evolved as a commemoration. On the 11th of November, 1918 itself, the day, incidentally, in which my grandfather got buried, um, was a day of victory. The celebrations were similar to those you got on VE Day in, in May 1945. But possibly, in Britain at least, the Second World War has only been celebrated in this way twice. First on the 11th of November 1918, and secondly in the um, victory celebrations in London in July 1919, after the signing of the Versailles Treaty. Ever since Armistice Day as it was, and Remembrance Sunday as it became has been an opportunity for sombre reflection on tragedy, loss and suffering. Yet I think if I was making a film, and I am a frustrated filmmaker, uh, about 1918, I think I would choose the German Spring Offensive. In fact, I did have, once have hopes of being summoned to make such a film, because Douglas Haig's grandson, Douglas Scott, of whom I was very fond, once found himself at lunch with Steven Spielberg's aunt. <laughs> and I think this was in the aftermath of Saving Private Ryan. And he was saying, Douglas, I don't know if you knew Douglas, but a most charming man, uh, Irish guards officer, you know, charming the lady, and said, well, you know, I think you, you could make a splendid film about the German spring offensive of, of, of 1918. And for weeks afterwards, I was, every time the phone rang and I wasn't quite there, I'd shout at my wife, who's a bit hard of hearing, say, get the phone, it might be Steven Spielberg! <laughs> but it never was. <laughs> the heroism shown by... Um, uh, British forces in, in the defence of Amiens, yeah. in the defence of uh, Ypres, or, or, or on, the, uh, on the lease in April 1918, the shattering defeat inflicted upon the German attackers by the Third Army in front of Arras during the German Spring Offensive are almost entirely forgotten. Not even, I suppose, despite the best efforts of Dan and Peter Snow, for which yeah. we must be grateful, um, as the 8th of August exactly stenciled itself on the British national memory in the way in which the 1st of July has. But 1918 is clearly one of the most important years of the 20th century. And I suppose arguably it is the most important year of the First World War because it was the last. Now if you take Rob's bookmaker uh, uh, analogy uh, that he used, what odds would you get on an Allied victory at Christmas 1917. Sir William Robertson, in reflecting upon what had been a very difficult year, said, I think the worst is over and the best is yet to come, which turned out to be correct. But even deep into the war, uh, deep into the, the year 1918, there are still, um, there is still a great deal of pessimism about whether the war can be successfully brought to a conclusion in 1918. 
The man who first sees the opportunities of, of victory on the Western Front is Douglas Haig. But as the, as the war approaches its conclusion, even Haig dips into a, a sort of um, pessimistic, the only pessimistic period he had during the war. He suddenly becomes nervous uh, that the Germans are going to drag the war into 1919 and that the difficulties that will, this will present, especially to the British. He'd been told that if the war goes on into 1919, we might have to find 50,000 coal miners out of the army because you need them back at home. Um, so we were expending manpower in 1918, which if the war had gone on into 1919, would be needed back in the factories again to keep the other troops in the field. So it was, from a manpower point of view, it was a close-run thing, rather like the manpower situation in the British Army in Northwest Europe in 1945. So how come that 1918 did turn out to be the year of victory. John Terrain famously described the German army as the motor of the First World War, the engine which drove the rest of it. And it's the Germans who drive 1918 and turned it into the, uh, brought about the events which we, we now know. If the British, the Americans and the French weren't exactly thinking that they were about to win the war in January 1918, Ludendorff was thinking that he had to win the war in 1918 because if it went on any longer, there was absolutely no possibility of them winning the war. Now, Ludendorff's own explanation of why he fought the way he did in 1918, which was written in his post-war memoirs in the atmosphere of German defeat, uh, portrays himself as having no choice but to do what he did. He had no choice to do what he did because he could not submit the German army to another round of battering that it had on the Somme uh, and at Third Ypres, that the Americans uh, would tip the manpower balance absolutely against the Germans. Uh, if the war had gone into 1919, the American expeditionary force would, st would have stood at over five million men. So this was a recognition uh, that Germany could not win um, Unless, a, it, it, if it allowed the Allies to maintain the strategic initiative, this was an effect of submitting to a defeat. But at the same time, the Germans were encouraged by the fact that they had won the war in the East. They had not signed a treaty in the East yet, and one of the things we should be grateful to Trotsky for, and there aren't many things to be grateful to Trotsky for, was to dragging the war into 1919. So the Germans still have a considerable number of troops on the Eastern Front uh, at the start of the spring before they force uh, the Soviets uh, to the peace treaty, to the peace table at treaties of um, Brest-Litovsk and Bucharest. But because of the Carthaginian nature of these pieces, the, the German army is compelled to retain large numbers of troops, particularly in the Ukraine, uh, to protect, guard, uh, police the areas which it had annexed under those treaties. Now, these were mainly not frontline troops, but there were a considerably large number of them. So in deciding how he's going to win the war, Ludendorff first decides that he must attack. That's sorted. Second place is, where do you attack? Well, they thought about following up the victory over Italy at Caporetto, but it's interesting that in you know, British historiography, as, uh, as various people have said, um, there's this idea that fighting on the Western Front was a pretty stupid idea and we should have found somewhere easier to fight, a soft underbelly of Europe. You know, we fight at Alexandretta or Salonika <coughs> or Gallipoli or wherever. And there is a kind of uh, a way to go round, as uh, Little Hart famously said, um, long way round, short way home, and we could sort of turn up in the Unter den Linden without the Germans noticing, having come round the back way and said, yeah, boo sucks, we've won. Um, Ludendorff did not believe that a victory was possible, except at the decisive place, and the decisive place was on the Western Front, so he rejected Italy and other subsidiary theatres uh, for that reason. His third problem was... Uh, how do you win? Um, one of the things that truly worries me about our great American allies is their fascination with German operational method. 
as Paddy Griffith famously said, uh, sent me a, an article once, he said, it was called Why the Germans Are So Bad at War. Uh, Paddy was not an admirer of German operational method. And uh, it's as though uh, the Americans, of course, are. There's lots of uh, congratulatory books written by Americans saying how wonderful the German army was. This must be the model for the United States arm, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. Mission control, um, devolution of command, high level of training commitment by soldiers who have a will to victory. Almost not noticing that they didn't actually win uh, either of the two world wars, which is uh, slightly disturbing uh, to me. Um, Ludendorff's answer to the question, or the conundrum of how to win the war in 1918, is not, as we've heard from Bill and, and, and Rob, uh, a material stroke technological stroke operational solution. It's a tactical solution, and it's one that's largely based uh, on manpower, clearly also with the integration uh, with artillery. The Germans... Um, I've received a great deal of credit for this. You know, there's lots of those admiring books about German stormtroopers in 1918 and how they managed to find an answer to the conundrum of trench warfare that had been denied to the Allies in the years before. Well, if getting your most highly committed, highly trained, flexible troops, sending them into action and getting them killed in savage numbers is a way of winning the war, I must have missed something. The German casualties in the spring offensive are absolutely colossal, and they also lost, essentially, their finest soldiers, um, which has an effect, I think, upon the generality of their infantry. There were, always, there were always sections of the German army right to the very end, as there were in 1945, both on the western and eastern fronts, who would fight you know, to the bitter end. But there were quite a lot who weren't prepared to fight to the bitter end in the second half of the war. But there is no doubt that the German army that went into action on the 21st of March 1918 was filled with the hope and prospect of victory, uh, encouraged by the, uh, the victories in the East, uh, encouraged by the fact that they were no longer having to sit in pillboxes and trenches, being shelled. I was going to say a rude word, but there's a young lady... The front row, uh, being shelled um, mercilessly, I think that was the word I was looking for, <laughs> shelled mercilessly uh, by the Allies. And, and this gave the, uh, you know, a hope to the Germans in attacking that they were going to bring this torment to an end. I'm not sure how long this lasts, because when you get German stormtroopers or follow-on troops, whatever they were, marching down the high street from Bapome to Albert and discovering the great supplies of Johnny Walker Scotch whiskey, uh, pork pies and God knows what else uh, that the British had left behind in their precipitate retreat, which rather undermined the view that they were given by their officers uh, that the uh, German unrestricted submarine warfare campaign was bringing Britain to its knees and it was in uh, need of star you know, dire starvation, which it clearly... Uh, Britain may have been starving, but it's clear that BEF was not at that point. The initial success of the German Spring Offensive, as I think coloured uh, so many views of it, it's the ultimate failure of it that is actually far more important. Because at a deep level, I don't know what they were trying to do. Clearly, they were trying to win the war, but... How were they trying to win the war? Now, war is a political act. Uh, Clausewitz said that uh, war is foreign policy carried on by other means, and if it's not that, then it's, well, it's a mere vulgar brawl on a large scale. Um, I, I was always struck by Sir John Keegan would, from time to time, either explicitly or implicitly, blame Clausewitz uh, for the horror of the First World War. Clausewitz had first to imagine this war before it could be carried out, uh, believing, uh, implying that Clausewitz had been the person who'd influenced the Germans. Well, it seems to me that Clausewitz's influence is least in Germany, um, where the idea that of the pr primacy of the political aim was completely lost. So we know the Germans don't need policy. Uh, the, the, if they'd done policy, they wouldn't have gone to war in the first place in 1914. 
As Hugh Strawn famously said, they don't do strategy either. But if you look at the German Spring Offensive and you read David Zabecki's wonderful book on it, it's clear that they don't do operations either. What they do is tactics. They're very good at tactics at the small unit level. And the tragedy of Germany and the German army and of Europe in the 20th century is that you have an army, because of the political, strategic and operational failures of German, the German state and the German army, is bound to lose eventually, but because it's so proficient at the tactical level and it has highly trained, highly motivated uh, soldiers who don't run away if you, you know, um, blow a, a horn, you know, they don't, they don't run away, uh, they will fight to the bitter end meant that defeating the Germans is in some ways always inevitable, uh, but it means that it's going to take an awful long time and you're going to suffer an awful lot of losses in order to be able to do it. Now, if Ludendorff's attack had any aim, it was surely to shatter the Anglo-French alliance. And in this, it not only um, failed, but it strengthened the Anglo-French alliance. So if, you like, if you're one of those type of people who likes to have a hero to decorate your narratives of events, then I'll offer you two heroes of 1918. David Lloyd George and Georges Clemenceau. In a profound sense, the Allies did not lose the war in 1918 because David Lloyd George and Georges Clemenceau had decided that they could not and would not. And I've often been critical of Mr Lloyd George, as some of you will know. Um, but Lloyd George confronted the German Spring Offensive in roughly the same state that Bob Bushaway was this morning. He was not a well man. Uh, despite this, um, he was a fighter and he was determined that we weren't going to lose the war. And in this, I think, he reflected um, Clemenceau's view. Clemenceau had come to power in France at the end of 1917 and a low point for France in the war. Uh, he had determined that France would be re-energised. He would get rid of duff generals. He would get rid of defeatists. He would get rid of pacifists. Uh, and he would energise the French state. And, um, you know, I, I look at Clemenceau, who was in his 70s at the time, and I think, my God, you know, if I had a tenth of his energy when I'm in my 70s, it would do me fine. Um, I think Clemenceau is a great man. I use that word advisedly. And in Ferdinand Foch... Um, Clemenceau found a French general of his own stamp and one who was capable of imposing upon the Allied war effort in 1918 the kind of coherence that it looked as though it had for a moment in 1916 before that was lost in the events of 1917. But the fact that Al Al in a war fought by an alliance, alliance solidarity is fundamental to success. And alliance solidarity was undoubtedly maintained. I think in some respects as a direct re result of the German Spring Offensive. It wobbled a little bit in the field. Haig was forever protesting about what a cowardly, um, self-interested person Petain was, I think unfairly in many respects. Um, but once the, the initial difficulties had been overcome in the first week of the German Spring Offensive, then I think the solidarity at the political level and then the solidarity at the strategic and operational level once Foch is appointed as making it almost impossible for the Germans to turn any kind of tactical success on the battlefield into a strategic or operational success, much less into a political victory. You also have the maintain maintenance of national solidarity. Now, there were many people in Britain when we went to war in 1914 who were clearly worried about whether national solidarity could be maintained in the face of a modern war. Now, we're talking about a Britain in 1914, which is probably 80% working class. And it's a country run by people who are 100% near enough, not working class. And they were bright enough to know that the working class was important, uh, but they didn't actually know that much about them. It was like some obscure African tribe, you know, that they'd occasionally sent people out into the abyss to find out what they might think about these things. And there had been some worrying signs in recruitment to the army during the South African War. But it's the, it's the solidarity of the British people behind the war effort, uh, and also of the French people behind their war effort, which is fundamental to an Allied victory during the war. 
Now, I was given a timely reminder of this. Um, I'm doing a, an, an article at the moment on my hometown, Burslem, in the Staffordshire Potteries during the war. And to this end, I've been working my way through the Staffordshire Weekly Sentinel um, for every year, uh, apart from <coughs> 1916, which the Stoke and Trent Archive Service has um, uh, lost. Uh, so being a good historian, I started at the end and worked, worked my way backwards and, and, and started in 1918. And there in 1918, April 1918, the Staffordshire Weekly Sentinel, a broadsheet, there is an account of Staffordshire miners volunteering for military service, April 1918. Not September 1914, April 1918. Volunteering for military service. Now this is in the context of Haig being told later in the year he might have to get 50,000 miners out of the army and bring them back home again because we need coal miners. Not only does coal run everything in Britain, it's running quite a lot of things in France and Italy as well. Coal miners are strategically important. And when conscription is introduced, there were many, some unreflecting soldiers who thought, oh, yummy, 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 this means more troops for the army. What it meant was, of course, having the right troops for the army and not taking those people out of civilian life, uh, about, out of the program of economic mobilization that you couldn't afford to lose. So the idea that, you could, that these guys were in, uh, under any threat of being called up is negligible. They were probably the safest people in Britain when it came to the idea of being called up. But they volunteered in considerably large numbers for military service. Why did they volunteer? Because they thought that we were threatened by invasion. It's a 1940 moment in 1918. And these people attested in my hometown at the second of our town halls, because we had two, and they marched down the spine road of the Staffordshire Potteries, which is now the A50, to Stoke Station on the main line where they entrained and were taken to Whittington Barracks Litchfield. The next step for me is to try and find out what happened to them. Mm. During this march, which is about four and a half miles of undulating terrain, they were greeted every yard of the way by cheering crowds which is not necessarily the view many people have of 1918. Now, I've argued that, in some ways, Germany was the perfect enemy for Britain in the First World War, because every time there looked like there might be a slump in British morale, the Germans did something that concentrated the mind. They used poison gas. They sank the Lusitania. They raped Belgian nuns and shot Belgian mares, whatever, whatever it was they would do something. And in 1918, it looked for a moment as though they may be in a position to invade the United Kingdom. And that is clearly not acceptable to the bulk of British people. Vera Britton, who at the time of the German Spring Offensive was working as a nurse uh, at Etat and the Great Base Hospital there, it's the first time in, in, in Vera Britain's experience of the First World War, which, as we all know, was a very bitter and tragic one, and to get worse, because her brother was killed in June 1918 on the Italian front, that we might actually lose the war. She didn't know exactly how we were going to win it, but she'd never thought that we might lose it. And at that moment, as she sees this great lines of um, wounded uh, mustard gas men from the Somme front being brought back along the lines to the base hospital late up. Her view was, we must not lose this war. This is somebody who later, of course, becomes a, a pacifist mm -hmm. and a key figure in CND. So the British people never got to the point where they were willing to exchange peace at the price of defeat. They wanted peace. They yearned for peace, but it was to be peace as the result of victory, not as the price of defeat. And I think that's also true of the French. I don't know whether it's the malign influence of Bill Philpott, but my, uh, <laughs> my view of the French has changed dramatically over the last few years. I mean, I have what you might call a traditional English view of the French. I uh, have lots of friends who send me witty things like, uh, if you put French military triumphs into Google, you don't get any hits, or that kind of thing. Is that 
the French war effort is an absolute epic of national resistance. When you think that you lost a, they lost a considerable part of their uh, industrial manufacturing, processing, mineral extraction it, during the German uh, invasion of 1914, that it's at its nearest point, as John Terrain was wont to point out, the German army was as close to Paris as Canterbury as to London, uh, that they had absolutely colossal losses, um, not least in terms of officers, in the first three weeks of the war, where we, we banged on about you know the heroic efforts of the BEF after Mons and Le Cato. It's an absolute pinprick compared to what the French were doing. And if any Frenchman of the First World War achieves greatness, uh, it's Joffre. On that day, in September 1914, when after a good lunch, I don't think there's ever been a crisis in the history of the world that would actually put Joffre off his lunch. <laughs> Dismissed his staff, went and sat under a tree in the shade at the French HQ at Bar sur Aube, and made the historic decision that Plan 17 had gone, was pants, and they had to move the army to the left flank and attack in what became the Battle of the Marne. Now, I, I've set, I, I used to have a first year, short first year course on the on this, and you'd say to first year students, you know, because you don't like expressing opinions, because they think you're God, they, they learn quite quickly that you're not, but, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're very nervous at expressing an opinion. I say, well, if you were Joff, what would you do? And they all get it right, because some of them might have read a book with the in, so they'll be no chance. <laughs> it's cheating. But the difference is, it wasn't your plan that was pants, it was Joff's. It wasn't your country that's threatened with an annihilating defeat. It's not your reputation that's on the line. It was yours. And to extract himself from that position in the way that he did and make the correct decision, I think that's greatness. It's one of the greatest decisions ever made by a general in the 20th century. France has a much smaller population than Britain or Germany. It mobilizes a massive army. One of the things that is commonplace among British soldiers' memoirs of the First World War is that when, they, when they're going up the line, they never see any French males of military age. The countryside and the villages are entirely peopled by <coughs> old men, old women, women, often widows, and young children. The men are all gone. France is still overwhelmingly a rural country. And that it was able to mobilise an army on the scale it did, while maintaining, and indeed as Bill explained, increasing industrial production, and developing one of Europe's most important aero industries. Um, and it's the, it's the, the American army in 1918 is largely uh, uh, supplied with American aircraft, uh, with uh, French aircraft, uh, French artillery. Uh, that it did this, and it was still able to feed its people at the same time, is an absolutely immensely impressive achievement. And I, I actually have read the book uh, that Bill mentioned about uh, French mo uh, mobilization of the French economy, and to read it is to be astonished, really. I think it's an absolutely extraordinary achievement. And that comes to the next level, why? They won in 1918, and that is because Allied economic mobilisation was much superior to that of Germany. I have a problem here for someone of my age, in that I was brought up in the um, afterglow of victory in the Second World War, and the Second World War falls into two phases. There's the period of German success, and then there's a period of Allied success. And the period of German success, particularly the, the defeat of France in 1940 and the evacuation from Dunkirk and so on, had an enormous influence on British perceptions of Germans. <coughs> Germans were efficient. They were good soldiers. Well, if you apply the efficiency, mind you, I've got such a lot of German colleagues at the University of Birmingham, and the idea that Germans are efficient, you should meet some of them. You've only got one who's efficient out of a lot of them, and she is a proper German. I mean, if she ran the world, it would be a much better place than it is. But the rest of them are a shambles. The Germans are not efficient. 
the, the running of the German war effort economically in the First World War pales into insignificance compared with the mobilization of the French for war and the British for war. And you have to remember that there's a tendency to read the Second World War back into the First. The United States was undoubtedly the arsenal of democracy in the Second World War, and it was the arsenal of democracy even before they declared war. It was not the arsenal of democracy in the First World War. And the Americans are largely dependent upon the British and the French for what they need when they get their massive number. Of, um, 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 American troops were largely brought to Europe in British ships. Uh, when they were there, they were equipped with French artillery and uh, French aircraft. Um, they imposed an enormous logistical drain, not least because their divisions are twice the size of anybody else's. Uh, one thing Americans are extremely good at, and the US Army is extremely good at, is logistics. Well, they were not good at it in 1917 and 1918, and you actually had American soldiers practically starving to death in the front line of the Argonne <coughs> because their supply system had broken down. It was quite rapidly repaired because one thing I've learned teaching American students over 30 years is that they have a very steep learning curve. They're very good at learning how to do things better uh, and doing it. But economic mobilization is absolutely one of the reasons why the Allies um, prevail. Also, of course, <coughs> manpower superiority. Now, Rob talked about the manpower difficulties uh, in 1917. The German army was uh, having similar manpower difficulties in 1917. And I think it's the arrival of the Americans has an immense psychological effect. And I think especially on the French, who feel lifted, who feel now once the Americans have come, they are not going to lose. Now, it takes more to make an army than having large numbers of troops, but it's a very good starting point. And we have, I think, manpower uh, superiority especially after so much of the German manpower is expended in the failed offensives in the first half of 1918. It makes me weep sometimes when I read that the Allies didn't win the war in 1918, the Germans lost it. What do these people think? The Germans were shooting one another? I mean, the reason the Germans lost in the spring offensive is we were killing their troops in large numbers. And this is one of the unappealing uh, aspects of war, that it's about killing people, as Bill said. And British soldiers, it's interesting to me that British soldiers are, are allowed to appear uh, in certain guises. One is victim. They can be victims. Uh, they can be naive. They can be, uh, they can be uh, innocent. Uh, they can suffer terribly, shell shock, wounds, death. What they're not allowed to do is kill anybody. Because you can't sentimentalise killing. You can sentimentalise dying, and people do all the time. But they can't sentimentalise killing. And the reason, the, the, the fundamental reason why the Germans lost in 1918 is the Allies killed large numbers of German troops. And as Trotsky, took, I never thought I was going to quote Trotsky twice <laughs> in a lecture, as Trotsky pointed out, the best way of demoralising an army is to kill its members in large numbers. And he was absolutely right. Of course we have material superiority as well. It's significant, the Germans never really uh, developed tanks. Uh, what the best tanks they had were refurbished British ones, and when you consider how rubbish the British tanks were, a refurbished German tank was probably nothing to write home about. Uh, they don't have uh, anything like the degree of motorised transport that we do. The British Army was already the most motorised in the world in 1914, and it had become motorised even further. One of the consequences of this is oil becomes yet more important. Um, the Royal Navy had converted to oil firing ships in 1912, and the problem with that is, you've got the greatest navy in the world, you don't actually have any oil, not in the United Kingdom anyway. So oil becomes much more important. Germany does not have easy access to supplies of oil. Um, and it's a, it's a key element in, in, in both world wars, the difficulties <coughs> the Germans uh, have with oil. Um, German motorised transport does not have rubber tyres, as, as Rob said. Um, and the substitute for motorised transport is horse transport. Mm -hmm. And the Germans have terrible problems getting access to horses as well. And we have a massive advantage here because we have access to horses from uh, Latin America, from North America, from the, uh, Canada, the United States, from Australia and so on. And we've learned many of the bitter lessons of the South African War where British horse management was appalling 
and horses died like flies, if you could use such a metaphor, uh, often, you know, within days of them arriving in, in the docks. We put that right. Only seven men in the British Expeditionary Force held the same post for the whole of the First World War, and one of them was the Director of Veterinary Services, John Moore, great name for a general. Um, so the, the, the British took, took care of their horses. They also had access to larger numbers of them than the Germans. And again, one of, the, one of the fundamental aspects which I don't think anyone's really mentioned in terms of you know, material superiority is food. The Germans, in both world wars, don't run out of troops completely. They don't run out of bullets and bombs and shells completely. But they are struggling with food. And what food they had, they didn't distribute effectively because they do not succeed in imposing a rational system of rationing within Germany, and they also make the mistake of thinking that the German soldier is a happy soldier if he has a sausage. <laughs> and in order to make a sausage, you have to get an animal, a pig or a cow or whatever, to eat large amounts of grain, whereas if you cut the uh, animal out of the production line and just get the grain, uh, it's a much more effective way of doing it. A book to me, which was a real eye-opener, was a, a book several years ago by Abner Offer, called an agrarian interpretation of the First World War, because we tend to interpret military effectiveness and the triumph of one set of allies over another very much in material, uh, industrial and uh, technological terms. But food is absolutely fundamental. And the German home front was absolutely struggling through the winter of 1917 and 18. Uh, and although there were problems in Britain in, in, in 1918, they were nothing like as serious as they were in Germany. And of course, the British Army itself, uh, the food may have been rather bland and, you know, uh, lacking. What, what the British soldier really wanted was coronation milk, lots of sugar in it. Um, the working class has a very sweet denture during this period. Um, the British did not run out of food. Uh, the British Army was well fed. The American Army was even better fed. Um, and this is one of the things which sustains uh, military morale on the battlefield. But as Bill said, it's no good having all this um, economic manpower and material superiority if you don't use it effectively. And in 1918, we did use it effectively. In fact, Rob nearly uh, gave the answer to this part of the lecture uh, in the way in which we differed from the way that we did it in 1917. We fought, um, we, were sh we showed, we and the French, though I know more about the British, and I blame um, Bill Phil Philpott entirely for this. I've learned lots from Bill Philpott's students about the battles of 1915 fought by the French army. I've learned a lot about uh, uh, French armoured doctrine in the First World War from Bill students. So either he hasn't got any working on 1918 or they haven't produced their PhDs yet, so tell them to get a move on, because I need to know more about the way the French army was operating operationally in 1918. We know the way it was operating strategically through Foch, etc. But at the operational level, we find, finally find a solution. And the solution is, in boxing terms, bob, uh, hit and move. Whereas in 1917, it's hit, stay in the same place, hit, stay in the same place, hit. Whereas in 1918, it's move. You hit the German army there. What normally happens operationally throughout the First World War is after about three days, the battle grinds to a halt. If you're going to reinforce it, it means reinforcing it under deteriorating terms and conditions. So the thing to do is to move it further up the line and attack somewhere else and keep the enemy off balance. Why didn't we do it in 1916? Oh, because we weren't capable of doing it in 1916. We probably didn't have enough stuff. We certainly didn't have enough people who knew what they were doing at every level. Because one of the consequences in the British Army of the rapid expansion in numbers is de-skilling at every level. So, you know, people don't know what they're doing. Um, I love that. 1950s thing you used to have on the back of cars, running in, please pass. Well, in 1918, the British Army was well run in. And you got people who knew what they were doing without being told. One of the most chilling documents I've ever read is Fourth Army Tactical Notes on the Somme, 16 pages. There you are, young, callow subaltern, going over the top, 
You've got to show moral fibre and courage. You go over the top. And so, 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 I think there's a German machine gun over there, so what do we do about it? And, Excuse me, you know, chap, I'm just, cons uh, just uh, consult my four by me tactical notes. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. <laughs> By 1918, you've got standard operating procedures. People know what to do in certain circumstances. I won't claim that the BEF or the French is a smoothly operating machine. It wasn't. I'm not sure there ever is a smoothly operating military machine, except maybe on the horse guard's parade on the official birthday of Her Majesty the Queen. But what military systems have to deal with is grit in the system. And grit is always going to be in the system. It's either going to be provided by the enemy, or, or by the terrain, or by the weather. And because the fighting in the second half of 1918 is not trench warfare, it's semi-mobile warfare, which presents on a, virtually on a daily basis a series of unprecedented challenges. Like for the first time, you've got to fight in a country which is full of hedges, like Normandy in 44, or you've got to fight in areas that's crisscrossed by water courses or whatever. And it's no good, you know, saying, well, you know, if we ask nicely, so Douglas A will send us a chip down and he'll tell us how to do it. People work out how to do it on an individual basis and carry it out. And one of the fundamentally impressive things is that they, they do have a way of doing it by this point. And it, it generally works. So what's telling is when they change the way of doing it such as in the breaking of the Hindenburg Line on the 29th of September 1918, when they do have a preliminary bombardment, which they revert back to because it's such a tough thing to bear. So having the courage, the belief, to abandon your cherished and clearly working operational method when the, pr when the problem which you're presented with suggests that you should do this implies a completely higher level of operation. Uh, than we saw in 1916 or even 1917. Field Marshal Montgomery in his uh, famous battle caravan on the Western Front uh, had a quote, O oh God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts. And in the end, no army can prevail unless its soldiers are willing to pay the sacrifices uh, of, of the soldier to risk death and be willing to inflict it upon the enemy. And because we have such a sentimental view of British soldiers in the First World War, we sort of lost track of this. But I want to end on the man who actually did win the war, Captain Arthur Humphrey Charlton, 1st 6th Battalion, the North Staffordshire Regiment, the man who captured the Rickerval Bridge on the 29th of September 1918, breaking the Hindenburg Line, which Frosch said uh, this was the blow for which there could be no German recovery. Arthur Humphrey Charlton was the son of the vicar of Abbot Bromley in Staffordshire. He was not a warrior. He didn't volunteer until November 1914, when he volunteered as a private in the veterinary corps, where he was given uh, responsibility for horses. The only known photograph of Humphrey Charlton is sitting on a horse wearing a cowboy hat in Canada uh, after the war. Um, he led his small group of men to capture the Rickerwell Bridge with uh, Lance Corporal Openshaw and Lance Corporal Smith. Lance Corporal Openshaw bayoneted, sentimentalised that, bayoneted the Germans who were about to light the fuse to blow up the bridge, and Lance Corporal Smith single-handedly killed the German machine gun crew. So I'm afraid they weren't all sitting in the front line, hoping that the war was winding down and coming to a halt, and reading the latest poem of Mr. Owen, <laughs> they were willing to take the war to the enemy and kill him because they still had what the Germans call the will to victory. Thank you very much. For you'll be to blame For love has fairly drove me silly Hoping you're the same It's a long way to Cipharelli It's a long way to go It's a long way to Cipharelli To the sweetest girl I know Goodbye, Piccadilly.